Hi guys, it's Mrs. Galvin. I am here to start a new read aloud with you. Uh, hopefully we can finish this before we hit um, the last day of school. So um, a couple of months to go and um, my goal is to make sure that I am doing a chapter, one chapter, um, three times a week. So um, the way I counted out, we should actually be done in about six weeks. So I think we should be good. But um, if you saw my post last week, you know that we are starting um, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. This is the first book in a seven book series, or I guess eight if you count. Um, there was one that was published a few years back, but in a different format. So um, we'll just say seven book series. Um, some of you might be familiar with this. Um, it would be hard not to at least be familiar with the name Harry Potter. It's a very common name and um, I have a lot of students um, in the past that have read it and parents that have read it to them. Um, I've definitely talked to a lot of parents that are huge fans like me of the series. Um, but this is one of my favorite series of all time. I think they're so fun and and just such a, a really just awesome story. So I thought we could do the read aloud for this book next. Um, so Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. This is book one. And um, these posts might be just a tiny bit longer than what you were seeing before because the chapters in this book are a little bit longer. So I used to try and hit like 14 to 16 minutes. Um, this definitely might be a longer video just because the chapters are a little bit longer. So we're gonna shoot for um, chapter one to complete chapter one today. So we're gonna jump right in. Um, definitely get somewhere super cozy. I am in my living room. My kids are in the other room. Um, working and watching. I have a cozy blanket and um, I'm just gonna snuggle right in and, and read. I suggest you do the same. Let's get started. Um, so Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone chapter one is The Boy Who Lived. Um, this book doesn't have many pictures just at the beginning of the chapter so I'll definitely be showing you those. <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Private Drive were proud to say they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Grennings, which made drills. He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large mustache. Mrs. Dursley was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on the neighbors. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion, there was no finer boy anywhere. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret, and their greatest fear was that somebody would discover it. They didn't think they could bear it if anyone found out about the Potters. Mrs. Potter was Mrs. Dursley's sister, but they hadn't met for several years. In fact, Mrs. Dursley pretended she didn't have a sister because her sister and her good-for-nothing husband were as un-Dursley-ish as it was possible to be. The Dursleys shuddered to think what the neighbors would say if the Potters arrived on the street. The Dursleys knew that the Potters had a small son too, but they had never seen him. The boy was another good reason for keeping the Potters away. They didn't want Dudley mixing with a child like that. When Mr. and Mrs. Dursley woke up on the dull gray Tuesday, our story starts. There was nothing about the cloudy sky outside to suggest that strange and mysterious things would soon be happening all over the country. Mr. Dursley hummed as he picked out his most boring tie for work, and Mrs. Dursley gossiped away happily as she wrestled a screaming Dudley into his high chair. None of them noticed a large, tawny owl flutter past the window. At half past eight, Mr. Dursley picked up his briefcase, pecked Mrs. Dursley on the cheek, and tried to kiss Dudley goodbye but missed because Dudley was now having a tantrum and throwing his cereal at the walls. Little tyke chortled Mr. Dursley as he left the house. He got into his car and backed out of number four's drive. It was on the corner of the street that he noticed the first sign of something peculiar, a cat reading a map. For a second, Mr. Dursley didn't realize what he had seen. Then he jerked his head around to look again. There was a tabby cat standing on the corner of private drive, but there wasn't a map in sight. What could, have, what could he have been thinking? It must have been a trick of the light. Mr. Dursley blinked and stared at the cat, and it stared back. As Mr. Dursley drove around the corner and up the road, he watched the cat in his mirror. It was now reading the sign that said Private Drive. No, looking at the sign. 
Cats couldn't read maps or signs. Mr. Dudley gave himself a little shake and put the cat out of his mind. As he drove toward town, he thought of nothing except a large order of drills he was hoping to get that day. But on the edge of town, drills were driven out of his mind by something else. As he sat in the usual morning traffic, he couldn't help noticing that there seemed to be a lot of strangely dressed people about, people in cloaks. Mr. Dursley couldn't bear people who dressed in funny clothes. The get-ups you saw on young people. He supposed this was some stupid new fashion. He drummed his fingers on the steering wheel and his eyes fell on a huddle of these weirdos standing quite close by. They were whispering excitedly together. Mr. Dursley was enraged to see that a couple of them weren't young at all. Why, that man had to be older than he was and wearing an emerald green cloak. The nerve of him. But then it struck Mr. Dursley that this was probably some silly stunt. These people were obviously collecting for something. Yes, that would be it. The traffic moved on and a few minutes later, Mr. Dursley arrived in the Grunnings parking lot, his mind back on drills. Mr. Dursley always sat with his back to the window in his office on the ninth floor. If he hadn't, he might have found it harder to concentrate on drills that morning. He didn't see the owls swooping past in broad daylight, though people down in the street did. They pointed and gazed open-mouthed as owl after owl sped overhead. Most of them had never seen an owl even at nighttime. Mr. Dursley, however, had a perfectly normal owl-free morning. He yelled at five different people. He made several important telephone calls and shouted a bit more. He was in a very good mood until lunchtime, when he thought he'd stretch his legs and walk across the road to buy himself a bun from the bakery. He'd forgotten all about the people in cloaks until he passed a group of them next to the bakers. He eyed them angrily as he passed. He didn't know why, but they made him uneasy. This bunch were whispering excitedly, too, and he couldn't see a single collecting tin. It was on his way back past them, clutching a large donut in a bag that he caught a few words of what they were saying. The Potters, that's right, that's what I heard. Yes, their son Harry. Mr. Dursley stopped dead, and fear flooded him. He looked back at the whispers as if he wanted to say something to them, but thought better of it. He dashed back across the road, hurried up to his office, snapped at his secretary not to disturb him, seized a telephone, and had almost finished dialing his home number when he changed his mind. He put the receiver back down and stroked his mustache, thinking, no, he was being stupid. Potter wasn't such an unusual name. He was sure there were lots of people called Potter who called their son Harry. And come to think of it, he wasn't even sure his nephew was called Harry. He'd never seen the boy. It might have been Harvey or Harold. There was no point in worrying Mrs. Dursley. She always got so upset at any mention of her sister. He didn't blame her if he'd had a sister like that. But all the same, those people in cloaks. He found it a lot harder to concentrate on drills that afternoon. And when he left the building at five o'clock, he was still so worried that he walked straight into someone just outside the door. Sorry, he grunted as the tiny old man stumbled and almost fell. It was a few seconds before Mr. Dursley realized that the man was wearing a violet cloak. He didn't seem at all upset at being almost knocked to the ground. On the contrary, his face split into a wide smile and he said in a squeaky voice that made a passerby stare, don't be sorry, my dear sir, for nothing could upset me today. Rejoice, for you know who has gone at last. Even muggles like yourself should be celebrating this happy, happy day. And the old man hugged Mr. Dursley around the middle and walked off. Mr. Dursley stood rooted to the spot. He had been hugged by a complete stranger. He also thought he had been called a muggle, whatever that was. He was rattled. He hurried to his car and set off for home, hoping he was imagining things, which he had never hoped before because he didn't approve of imagination. As he pulled into the driveway of number four, the first thing he saw, and it didn't improve his mood, was the tabby cat he'd spotted that morning. It was now sitting on his garden wall, and he was sure it was the same one. It had the same markings around its eyes. Shoo, said Mr. Dursley loudly. The cat didn't move. It just gave him a stern look. Was this normal cat behavior? Mr. Dursley wondered. Trying to pull himself together, he let himself into the house. He was still determined not to mention anything to his wife. Mrs. Dursley had had a nice, normal day. She told him over dinner all about Mrs. Nextdoor's problem with her daughter and how Dudley had learned a new word, won't. Mr. Dursley tried to act normally. When Dudley had been put to bed, he went into the living room in time to catch the last report on the evening news. And finally, bird watchers everywhere have reported that the nation's owls have been behaving very unusually today. Although owls normally hunt at night and are hardly ever seen in daylight, there have been hundreds of sightings of these birds flying in every direction since sunrise. Experts are unable to explain why the owls have suddenly changed their sleeping pattern. The newscaster allowed himself a grin. Most mysterious. And now over to Jim McGuffin with the weather. Jim, going to be any more showers of owls tonight? Well, Ted, said the weatherman, I don't know about that, but it's not only the owls that have been acting oddly today. 
Viewers as far apart as Kent, Yorkshire, and Dundee have been phoning in to tell me that instead of the rain I promised yesterday, they've had a downpour of shooting stars. Perhaps people have been celebrating bonfire night early. It's not until next week, folks, but I can promise a wet night tonight. Mr. Dursley sat frozen in his armchair. Shooting stars all over Britain? Owls flying by daylight? Mysterious people in cloaks all over the place? And a whisper, a whisper about the potters. Mrs. Dursley came into the living room carrying two cups of tea. It was no good. He'd have to say something to her. He cleared his throat nervously. Um, Petunia, dear, you haven't heard from your sister lately, have you? As he had expected, Mrs. Dursley looked shocked and angry. After all, they normally pretended she didn't have a sister. No, she said sharply. Why? Funny stuff on the news, Mr. Dursley mumbled. Owls and shooting stars, and there were a lot of funny-looking people in town today. So, snapped Mrs. Dursley. Well, I just thought, maybe, it was something to do with, you know, her crowd. Mrs. Dursley sipped her tea through pursed lips. Mr. Dursley wondered whether he dared tell her he heard the name Potter. He decided he didn't dare, and instead he said, as casually as he could, Their son, he'd be about Dudley's age now, wouldn't he? I suppose so, said Mrs. Dursley stiffly. What's his name again? Howard, isn't it? Harry, nasty common name, if you ask me. Oh, yes, said Mr. Dursley, his heart sinking horribly. Yes, I, I quite agree. He didn't say another word on the subject as they went upstairs to bed. And while Mrs. Dursley was in the bathroom, Mr. Dursley crept to the bedroom window and peered down into the front garden. The cat was still there. It was staring down Private Drive as though it were waiting for something. Was he imagining things? Could all this have anything to do with the Potters? And if it did, if it got out that they were related to a pair of, well... He didn't think he could bear it. The Dursleys got into bed, and Mrs. Dursley fell asleep quickly, but Mr. Dursley lay awake, turning it all over in his mind. His last comforting thought before he fell asleep was that even if the Potters were involved, there was no reason for them to come near him and Mrs. Dursley. The Potters knew very well what he and Petunia thought about them and their kind. Couldn't see how he and Petunia could get mixed up in anything that might be going on. He yawned and turned over. It couldn't affect them. How very wrong he was. Mr. Dursley might have been drifting into an uneasy sleep, but the cat on the wall outside was showing no sign of sleepiness. It was stirring as still as a statue, its eyes fixed unblinkingly on the far corner of Private Drive. It didn't so much as quiver when a car door slammed on the next tree, nor when two owls swooped overhead. In fact, it was nearly midnight before the cat moved at all. A man appeared on the corner the cat had been watching appeared so suddenly and silently you'd have thought he just popped out of the ground. The cat's tail twitched and its eyes narrowed. Nothing like this man had ever been seen on private drive. He was tall and thin and very old, and judging by the silver of his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt, he was wearing long robes, a purple cloak that swept the ground, and high-heeled buckled boots. His blue eyes were light, bright, and sparkling behind half-moon spectacles, and his nose was very long and crooked as though it had been broken at least twice. This man's name was Albus Dumbledore. Albus Dumbledore didn't seem to realize that he had just arrived in a street where everything from his name to his boots was unwelcome. He was busy rummaging in his cloak looking for something, but he didn't. But he did seem to realize that he was being watched because he looked up suddenly at the cat, which was still staring at him from the other end of the street. And for some reason, the sight of the cat seemed to amuse him and he chuckled and muttered, I should have known. He found what he was looking for inside his pocket. It seemed to be a silver cigarette lighter. He flicked it open, held it up in the air, and clicked it. The nearest street lamp went out with a little pop, and he clicked it again, and the next lamp flickered out into darkness. Twelve times he clicked the putter, put outer until the only lights left on the whole street were two tiny pinpricks in the distance, which were the eyes of the cat watching him. If anyone looked out of their window now, even beady-eyed Mrs. Dursley, they wouldn't be able to see anything that was happening down on the pavement. Dumbledore slipped the put-outer back inside his cloak and set off down the street toward number four, where he sat down on the wall next to the cat. He didn't look at it, but after a moment he spoke to it. Fancy seeing you here, Professor McGonagall. He turned to smile at the tabby, but it had gone. Instead, he was smiling at a rather severe-looking woman who was wearing square glasses exactly the shape of the markings that the cat had around its eyes. She, too, was wearing a cloak, an emerald one, and her black hair was drawn into a tight bun. She looked distinctively ruffled. How do you know it was me, she asked. My dear professor, I've never seen a cat sit so stiffly. 
You'd be stiff if you'd been sitting on a brick wall all day, said Professor McGonagall. All day? When you could have been celebrating? I must have passed a dozen feasts and parties on my way here. Professor McGonagall sniffed angrily. Oh yes, everyone's celebrating all right, she said impatiently. You'd think they'd be a bit more careful, but no, even the muggles have noticed something's going on. It was on their news. She jerked her head back at the Dursley's dark living room window. I heard it, flocks of owls shooting stars. Well, they're not completely stupid. They were bound to notice something. Shooting stars down in Kent, I'll bet that was Daedalus Diggle. He never had much sense. Well, you can't blame them, said Dumbledore gently. We've had precious little to celebrate for 11 years. I know that, said Professor McGonagall irritably. But that's no reason to lose our heads. People are downright careless, out on the streets in broad daylight, not even dressed in muggle clothes, swapping rumors. She threw a sharp sideways glance at Dumbledore here, as though hoping he was going to tell her something. But he didn't, so she went on. A fine thing it would be if, on the very day you know who seems to have disappeared at last, the muggles found out about us all. I suppose he really has gone, Dumbledore. It certainly seems so, said Dumbledore. We have much to be thankful for. Would you care for a lemon drop? A what? A lemon drop? They're a kind of muggle sweet that I'm rather fond of. No, thank you, said Professor McGonagall coldly, as though she didn't think this was the moment for lemon drops. As I say, even if you know who has gone, my dear Professor, surely a sensible person like yourself can call him by his name? All this you-know-who nonsense. For 11 years, I have been trying to persuade people to call him by his name, his proper name, Voldemort. Professor McGonagall flinched, but Dumbledore, who was unsticking two lemon drops, seemed not to notice. It all gets so confusing if we keep saying you-know-who. I have never seen any reason to be frightened of saying Voldemort's name. I know you haven't, said Professor McGonagall, sounding half exasperated and half admiring. But you're different. Everyone knows you're the only one you-know-who... Oh, all right, Voldemort was frightened of. You flatter me, said Dumbledore calmly. Voldemort had powers I will never have, only because you're too, well, noble to use them. It's lucky it's dark. I haven't blushed so much since Madame Pomfrey told me she liked my new earmuffs. Professor McGonagall shot a sharp look at Dumbledore and said, The owls are nothing next to the rumors that are flying around. You know what everyone's saying about why he's disappeared, about what finally stopped him? It seemed that Professor McGonagall had reached the point that she was most anxious to discuss, the real reason she had been waiting on a cold, hard wall all day. For neither as a cat nor as a woman had she fixed Dumbledore with such a piercing stare as she did now. It was plain that whatever everyone was saying, she was not going to believe it until Dumbledore told her it was true. Dumbledore, however, was choosing another lemon drop and did not answer. What they're saying, she pressed on, is that last night Voldemort turned up in Godric's Hollow. He went to find the Potters. The rumor is that Lily and James Potter are, are, that they're dead. Dumbledore bowed his head and Professor McGonagall gasped. Lily and James? I can't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. Oh, Albus. Dumbledore reached out and patted her on the shoulder. I know, I know, he said heavily. Professor McGonagall's voice trembled as she went on. That's not all. They're saying that he tried to kill the Potter's son, Harry, but he couldn't. He couldn't kill the little boy. No one knows why or how, but they're saying that when he couldn't kill Harry Potter, Voldemort's power somehow broke, and that's why he's gone. Dumbledore nodded glumly. It's, it's true, faltered Professor McGonagall. After all he's done, all the people he's killed, he couldn't kill a little boy? It's just astounding, all the things to stop him, but how in the name of heaven did Harry survive? We can only guess, said Dumbledore. We may never know. Professor McGonagall pulled out a lace handkerchief and dabbed at her eyes beneath her spectacles. Dumbledore gave a great sniff as he took a golden watch from his pocket and examined it. It was a very odd watch. It had 12 hands, but no numbers. Instead, little planets were moving around the edge. It must have made sense to Dumbledore, though, because he put it back in his pocket and said, Hagrid is late. I suppose it was he who told you I'd be here, by the way. Yes, said Professor McGonagall, and I don't suppose you're going to tell me why you're here of all places. I've come to bring Harry to his aunt and uncle. They're the only family he has left now. You don't mean... You can't mean the people who live here, cried Professor McGonagall, jumping to her feet and pointing at number four. Dumbledore, you can't. I've been watching them all day. You couldn't find two people who are less like us. And they've got this son. I saw him kicking his mother all the way up the street, screaming for sweets. Harry Potter, come and live here? It's the best place for him, said Dumbledore firmly. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain everything to him when he's older. I've written them a letter. A letter, repeated Professor McGonagall faintly sitting back down on the wall. Really, Dumbledore, you think you can explain all this in a letter? 
These people will never understand him. He'll be famous, a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future. There will be books written about Harry. Every child in our world will know his name. Exactly, said Dumbledore, looking very seriously over the top of his half moon spectacles. It would be enough to turn any boy's head, famous before he can walk and talk, famous for something he won't even remember. Can't you see how much better off he'll be growing up away from all that until he's ready to take it? Professor McGonagall opened her mouth and changed her mind and swallowed and then said, Yes, yes, you're right, of course, but how is the boy getting here, Dumbledore? She eyed his cloak suddenly as though she thought he might be hiding Harry underneath it. Hagrid's bringing him. You think it wise to trust Hagrid with something as important as this? I would trust Hagrid with my life, said Dumbledore. I'm not saying his heart isn't in the right place, said Professor McGonagall grudgingly, but you can't pretend he's not careless. He does tend to... What was that? A low rumbling sound had broken the silence around them. It grew steadily louder as they looked up and down the street for some sign of a headlight. It swelled to a roar as they both looked up at the sky, and a huge motorcycle fell out of air and landed on the road in front of them. If the motorcycle was huge, it was nothing to the man sitting astride it. He was almost twice as tall as a Norma man and at least five times as wide. He looked simply too big to be allowed and so wild. Long tangles of bushy black hair and a beard hid most of his face. He had hands the size of trash can lids, and his feet in their leather boots were like baby dolphins. In his vast muscular arms, he was holding a bundle of blankets. Hagrid, said Dumbledore, sounding relieved, at last. And where did you get that motorcycle? Borrowed it, Professor Dumbledore, sir, said the giant, climbing carefully off the motorcycle as he spoke. Young, serious black lent it to me. I've got him, sir. No problems were there? No, sir. House was almost destroyed, but I got him out all right before the muggles started swarming in. He fell asleep as we was flying over Bristol. Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall bent forward over the bundle of blankets. Inside, just visible, was a baby boy fast asleep. Under a tuft of jet black hair over his forehead, they could see a curiously shaped cut, like a bolt of lightning. Is that where, whispered Professor McGonagall? Yes, said Dumbledore. He'll have that scar forever. Couldn't you do something about it, Dumbledore? Even if I could, I wouldn't. Scars can come in handy. I have one myself above my left knee that is a perfect map of the London underground. Well, give him here, Haggard. We'd better get this over with. Dumbledore took Harry in his arms and turned toward the Dursley's house. Could I... could I say goodbye to him, sir? asked Haggard. He bent his great shaggy head over Harry and gave him what must have been a very scratchy, whiskery kiss. And then suddenly Haggard let out a howl like a wounded dog. Shh! His Professor McGonagall. You'll wake the muggles. Sorry, sobbed Hagrid, but I can't, I can't stand it. Lily and James dead and poor little Harry off to live with muggles. Yes, yes, it's all very sad, but get a grip on yourself, Hagrid, or we'll be found. Professor McGonagall whispered, patting Hagrid gingerly on the arm as Dumbledore stepped over the low garden wall and walked to the front door. He laid Harry gently on the doorstep, took a letter out of his cloak and tucked it inside Harry's blankets and then came back to the other two. And for a full minute, the three of them stood and looked at the little bundle. Hagrid's shoulders shook and Professor McGonagall blinked furiously and the twinkling light that usually shone from Dumbledore's eyes seemed to have gone out. Well, said Dumbledore finally, that's that. We've no business staying here. We may as well go and join the celebrations. Yeah, said Hagrid in a very muffled voice. I'd best get this bike away. Good night, Professor McGonagall. Professor Dumbledore, sir. Wiping his streaming eyes on his jacket sleeve, Hagrid swung himself onto the motorcycle and kicked the engine into life. With a roar, it rose into the air and off into the night. I shall see you soon, I expect, Professor McGonagall, said Dumbledore, nodding to her. Professor McGonagall blew her nose in reply. Dumbledore turned and walked back down the street. On the corner, he, popped, he stopped and took out the silver put-outer. He clicked it once, and twelve balls of light sped back to their street lamps so that private drive glowed suddenly orange, and he could make out a tabby cat slinking around the corner at the other end of the street. He could just see the bundle of blankets on the step of number four. Good luck, Harry, he murmured, and he turned on his heel, and with a swish of his cloak, he was gone. A breeze ruffled the neat hedges of Private Drive, which lay silent and tidy under the inky sky, the very last place you would expect astonishing things to happen. Harry Potter rolled over inside his blankets without waking up. One small hand closed on the letter beside him, and he slept on, not knowing he was special, not knowing he was famous not knowing he would be woken in a few hours' time by Mrs. Dursley's scream as she opened the front door to put out the milk bottles, nor that he would spend the next few weeks being prodded and pinched by his cousin Dudley. He couldn't know that at this very moment, people meeting in secret all over the country were holding up their glasses and saying in hushed voices, to Harry Potter, the boy who lived. 
Okay, so a long video. Um, some of these chapters, like I said, are kind of long. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed the first chapter of the book and um, definitely um, pay attention to when I post the videos so you can keep up on all of our reading. Thanks for listening. Bye, guys.